Muito boa tarde. Vamos dar início a esta sessão, mais uma sessão comemorativa dos 30 anos do CBQF. Uh, e é com muito gosto que convido cada um dos participantes uh, durante a sessão, querendo coloque questões no Q&A, uh, que fica em baixo no vosso ecrã. Sem demoras, passo a palavra ao Dr. João Cortes, enquanto membro do, da direção do CBKF. So, uh, thank you, Maria. Um, our uh, guest speaker is uh, uh, not uh, Portuguese, so the session will be held in English and therefore I'll be speaking in English. So, first of all, I would like to wish a good afternoon to all participants and welcome you to this seminar, which is part of a series of events in a program that celebrates the 30th anniversary of CBQF, the Center for Biotechnology and Fine Chemistry. So on behalf of the uh, Board of Directors of CBQF, it is with delight that I open this third seminar of this series, uh, which is part of a cycle that uh, takes place on the last Thursday of each month. So the dates are announced on the website and via social media and email. So in this event, we will have uh, yet another renowned speaker on a topic that is aligned with the CBQF's main lines of research. And I would like to welcome Professor Mark van Lutstrek uh, and ask Professor Paula Castro, uh, the director of um, our School of Biotechnology to introduce him. So I hope you will enjoy this seminar. I'm sure you will. Uh, and thank you all uh, for uh, attending and in particular to the organization of this series of events. Paula, please. Thank you, Joel. Good afternoon to everyone and welcome to ESP online to this uh, third, third seminar on our cycle of the commemorations of the 30 years of CBKF. And uh, I'm here to present uh, our guest speaker, Mark, uh, Professor Mark van Lusrech, um, because he's, uh, he's been uh, collaborating with us for many years and he's, uh, he's a good friend uh, of ours, uh, of us. Um, I will introduce our guest and I will start by greeting him and uh, say a special thanks for uh, being here with us today. Not in presence, but uh, online. Uh, professor Mark van Lusrech is a professor at Delft University. He's been at Delft since uh, 88, so quite a few decades already. And he graduated from Wageningen University. And over this past uh, 30 years or so, he's been uh, engineering microbial ecosystems to apply to, to water and wastewater treatment. And uh, he does this not only to return the water safely to the environment, but also in a perspective of uh, resource recovery from, uh, from this uh, so important sector of the water. So it, it, it's actually a very hot topic on uh, resource recovery and uh, the bioeconomy and the circular economy it's important for the planet and it's important for the whole society. And he is renowned worldwide for this because most of his research has reached uh, a practical application. We have uh, processes around the world that were developed uh, scientifically by, by the group of uh, Professor Mark van Lutzrecht, such as the Sharon process, the Anamox, and most recently the Nereda. He has new technology emerging, going to commercialization steps in this uh, new field of resource recovery, such as Calmira and bioplastics that probably we'll talk uh, about during his talk. His uh, commitment to science and also to outreach is really impressive. He's an active member um, of the International Water Association, IWA, is the editor-in-chief of one of the top journal 
uh, top channels in the environment sector and water in particular, water research. He has several awards and prizes. He's the member of the Royal Dutch Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Dutch USA and Chinese Academy of Engineering. I have to read this because it's uh, so many things. He, uh, he has an impressive track record of publications. There's more than 850 scientific papers, 20 patents, and it's, it's really impressive, his, um, his achievements. And it is a, an honor to, to have him also on the advisory board of our CBKF. He's been, um, we have been collaborating with Professor Mack for over 15 years in projects, in co-supervising the PhD students. It's really been important, important for the development of this area in the, in the school uh, that is in the group of um, environment and resources. So thanks, Mark, for being with us in this, uh, in, in this uh, also the, these developments that we do in this area. And once I heard the talk of um, Mark in, uh, in uh, innovation and open innovation, and it really struck me because uh, in the end, the message I took is innovation is what you do when you can make things happen. And correct me if it was not what you said, but that's, that's the message that I took home. And you only have that when we involve all the stakeholders from the beginning. And I think that this is what will what Mark will uh, talk about us to uh, talk about today, and we I'm sure we'll all learn a lot uh, from him. Thanks, Mark, from being uh, with for being with us today, and um, we'll have him now. So I will ask Mark to be on. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Okay. Now we'll share my screen to put up the PowerPoint presentation. Yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, uh, congratulations, of course, with the 30 years anniversary of the Biotech Institute in uh, Catolica and Porto. It's always a big achievement to get the group going and to really make impact and I'm sure sure the, that's what is happening in, in your institute. It's a pleasure to present uh, to you some of the work uh, this afternoon. It's less a pleasure that I don't have the option to drink a port wine afterwards <laughs> in the in sunny Porto. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> I will keep hanging around for those people who uh, like to discuss issues which I'm presenting also after the lecture. So I will present to you a bit our ideas and things around resource recovery from uh, wastewater. I will not try to make an exhaustive list of all we do or all, all what is all possible, but I will um, um, give you a slight overview of some of the aspects and some flavor of how I think resource recovery should work. Now, <clears throat> wastewater treatment has always been an activity uh, more for sanitation uh, of um, uh, aspects in society, contributing a great deal. That's also the most important task, and it will remain the most important task for wastewater treatment. Just prevent spread of diseases in society. All kind of waterborne pathogens uh, are taken out, and this, that cycle is broken. So by definition, what we try to do with a wastewater treatment is to break the cycle of, of, of pathogens. And in that sense, we have tried to be non-circular. But at the same time, with the increased demand uh, on resources due to strong population growth, increase in wealth, we have to be more and more resource efficient as society. And we also have to look um, at all kinds of alternative resources, which until now we generally call waste. And we try to convert that into uh, useful products. And if you look there in the in the context of uh, of a wastewater treatment plant, because that's the setting from which uh, we we look, and then there's are several ob obvious things which are generally mentioned: water, energy, and nutrients. And I like to add there the attention for chemicals because I believe that's the resource which could recover. Um, not only because it's nice to recover, but also because it can economically be of interest. 
and in that sense drive the whole recovery uh, process. Now, if you look to recall resource recovery possibilities, we recently made an overview of all kinds of resource recovery possibilities in these different areas. So water, fertilizer, energy, and uh, products. And it's maybe not that, prop not that needed to look to all the detailed uh, options which are there. If there. You can read the paper if you, if you like. But if you see the black boxes in these, that are the options which are really applied in full scale, whereas the blue boxes are, you could say still blue sky, research at universities, all kind of potential ways to recover water, fertilizers, energy, and certainly products, but they have not yet made it into the market. And you also see that, especially in the water recovery field, there's the biggest amount of, say, gray areas. That's what already has been employed in practice. And that's, of course, because um, being in the wastewater sector, very close to the water sector in general, um, recovery of water will be the most obvious one, and it either for, for irrigation or for drinking water production. Now, if you look to the current resource recovery practice, and I have to admit, I will do this largely from a Dutch perspective, because that's the environment where I'm used to. Um, if I overcharge it a bit, I can say that the, the water boards are mainly working currently on resource recovery in practice because it's very good in public perception. There's a drive in all society to be circular, to recover materials, not to waste. And the water boards are a public utility, so they, on the demand of public and government, they are interested to see how far they can go, what they can do in the context of resource recovery. Um, which in, at the same time means they don't see it as the primary process at the moment, but as something which is important, but not yet completely central. Now, from the different materials we can recover, um, there, is, uh, there are different ways to, to look at it. Uh, they cannot be compared to each other. Um, and that is the setting. So water recovery, that is usually happening as soon as there is a shortage of water. It's very straightforward. Um, it's happening. Prices are not that, that expensive to do it, certainly if you are on the water constraint conditions. Uh, so that's a kind of technology which is there and which is applied as soon as the surroundings demand more water. For nutrients, the attention is mainly on phosphate. Um, there, is, there is about maybe 10 plants in the Netherlands where phosphate is recovered. And in most cases, the, the real reason to recover it is not the recovery of phosphate, but because if you recover phosphate, you minimize maintenance problems in the treatment plant and you have a better sludge dewatering. So effectively, the phosphate recovery is paid for by lower cost in the operation of the treatment plant. And then at the same time, it's of course used, as in, this, as in the pictures here, to uh, uh, communicate to the public where the phosphate is then, say, given back to the public to fertilize their gardens. Um, with energy, it's a different thing. So energy recovery in the form of biogas is a very long-standing tradition, um, mainly motivated by minimizing sludge. It's, of course, again, advertised as we make biogas, we make bioenergy, but the main reason that the water boards do this currently is simply that if you do anaerobic digestion of sludge, you minimize the sludge and the cost for anaerobic digestion are lower than the cost for sludge disposal. And that's the same for cellulose recovery. In the Netherlands, there are about five plants which also recover cellulose from the wastewater. And cellulose is, of course, derived from the toilet paper. Everyone discharged in the toilets. <coughs> uh, for cellulose recovery, it's mainly the fact that there is lower sludge production because the cellulose is, is 10 to 20 percent of the total waste sludge. So if it's a very simple operation, you can minimize that and save cost. That means that in practice, currently resource recovery from wastewater, also in the Netherlands, is mainly run by internal drivers, optimizing the primary process, namely treating wastewater, and not 
this is the kind of external driver that there's really a demand to the energy or the phosphate or the cellulose which is produced at a treatment plant. And this is immediately also the real problem to, to go further. That demand is not there yet, and that is also stopping for a large part of the further development, because as you can see, implementation is not really the problem, the economy is not the problem, but the demand for these products is the problem. And that's certainly there where you talk about uh, chemical recovery, I will do later a bit more. Um, uh, due to the fact that there's not a good scheme how to um, make materials which recover at the treatment plant into a consumer product. And most of the production industry is based on fossil fuels, so you have large production of oil or other fossil resources like uh, Phosphate, they come with bulk carriers into the harbor. They're in a big factory turned over into products, and one factory might supply all of Europe. And this is all in private hands. Now, if you try to make products out of waste work, then we start usually at the public site, because certainly the toilet, but probably also the sewer system, the collection system, and the wastewater treatment plants, they are public enterprises. And they produced and maybe a product, in this case, a polymer in the picture, but like phosphate or other things. And um, these products have to be brought to these production processes and in the end to consumer products. That means there's a transition from a public authority to a private company, which is not that straightforward in, on a political level and on an economic level, if you start thinking about it. And the how to handle it in the chemical industry, in the production industry, that you would not have one big supplier of your raw resources, but that you have multiple suppliers of your resources. Like in the Netherlands, there would be already 300 wastewater treatment plants. So 300 suppliers only in the Netherlands, instead of one supplier like the phosphate for the whole of Europe. So that, that line of thinking is where is, is a limitation. I will not go in depth of it, but this is, in my view, a major bottleneck to solve, besides that we can do also a lot of nice engineering. The other aspect we are getting uh, towards is that um, in the end, we have to look to the wastewater treatment plant as one integrated system. In this case, it's the wastewater treatment plant in Utrecht. I will come again later on, come back to that. Uh, but until now, resource recovery is something like, okay, we can recover phosphate or we can recover energy or we can recover polymers. But in the end, that has to be integrated in one uh, integrated, uh, you could say, refinery for wastewater or factory. And also there, that's still limiting because in most cases, the treatment plant just implement one unit currently just to show how it works. But for full integration, there's still a bit of quite a bit of steps to make and together. And also that needs more attention than until now. Now, some thoughts about the different options for recovery. So energy is, is one of the most advertised uh, compounds to recover. And then if you look in literature and in, in, the, in the general conferences, um, there's a lot of attention then for biogas, sometimes for microbial fuel cells or other ways to recover energy from the organic carbon in, in the wastewater. Now, in, in my view, if, it, if you're really concerned about energy, um, in many ways for tumor plants, you can still save a lot of energy before you start producing. If saving energy is always more easy. It's less glamorous than producing something. To do, just do your work efficiently, but there is still space in most treatment plants to save and optimize energy. And my intuition is that's around 20 to 30 percent. If you talk about energy production, um, that will never be an economic factor for the treatment plant because energy is very cheap. Only if there's subsidy on, say, green energy, like the energy derived from biogas, then um, it can be economically interesting. For the wastewater treatment plant, it would be economically interesting not to supply energy back to the, the grid or to the society, but to become completely independent and cut the line with the energy factory, the electricity producer, because that's a big uh, cost factor. The 
the connection itself, not so much the electricity which is taken. So if you can design and operate and optimize your treatment plant in such a way that you produce enough energy at the treatment plant itself, then you can get a, lot, a big cost reduction, not from the energy sales, but from minimizing the contract with the electricity supplier. Um, one aspect we are looking at, and which is, uh, so energy production is, is an old fashioned technology, you could almost say. There's a lot of attention at the moment for um, thermal processing of sludge and make it better digestible. I believe there's a lot of option also in more alkaline digestion where we're looking at at the moment. Because also in the alkaline condition, the organic carbon becomes much better available for digestion. The, the yield go up by, by 20 or 30 percent in methane. And if you do it and you do your digestion in the alkaline condition, your CO2 remains as bicarbonate in the liquid and you produce a directly a green gas with a higher economic value. So you make something with a higher thermal energy and you convert more of your organic carbon into biogas. But the real advantage would be in the end to use the heat in the effluent. In principle, the heat, which is present in the wastewater, is about 10 times more energy than what you can produce in the form of biogas. At the same time, um, for energy neutrality and energy recovery, the attention to recover heat from the wastewater is relatively low. There's much more in the news and in the, uh, the scientific journals on biogas formation than on heat recovery. But there are several options. And uh, for instance, also in the Netherlands, there's now three treatment plants where uh, heat is recovered and then supplying uh, that back to, to households in the winter is uh, some kind of storage in the aquifers. Um, but that's used for, for, for heating, uh, district heating with about uh, several ten thousands of houses currently, and that's increasing. In more warmer climates, instead of heat, you can also deliver cooling energy in this, in this way. A bit less efficient, but still uh, a possibility. If you look to nutrients, phosphate recovery gets a lot of attention because phosphate is the limiting resource and yeah, probably one of the first resources we run out of. And for phosphate, there's no replacement. If, if the phosphate mines are empty, there's not, nothing we can replace phosphate with. With oil, we can replace oil with solar cells, with uh, wind energy. So we can derive the energy from other things than oil. But for phosphate, which is needed for plant growth, we cannot replace phosphate with something, some alternative. So that's why it's important to be very efficient with phosphate. Now, currently, the phosphate recovery is very much oriented to struvite recovery. And the way that is implemented in treatment plants means effectively only 10 or 15 percent of the phosphate load can be recovered from the weight from the treatment plant. So it is nice. It's an interesting option. It's also a economically more or less an option, but it's on the long run, not the way uh, it should be, because you like to recover 100 percent of the phosphate and new methods are needed. One method would be to burn the sludge then the phosphate will end up in the ashes and you can leach it out of the ashes like in the mining industry. Uh, another one we have been looking at is look to alternative phosphate minerals. And one of these minerals is, is vivianite. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing from vivianite is that it is already present in digesters. So you can, uh, if you have digesters, there's always iron coming in. And certainly if you have chemical phosphate removal, uh, vivianite is formed in the digester and you will have about <clears throat> 60 70 percent of the vivianite already present and you can drive that up to about 80 90 percent if you want <clears throat> which would mean that 80 90 percent of the phosphate from the influence you can recover as vivianite now vivianite is a nice blue mineral which on the right hand side picture here is scaling of a pipe at the treatment plant. So this was the interior of the pipe. <clears throat> and um, that Vivianite has also a nice link with Delft because one of the famous painters from Delft, Vermeer, in the Middle Ages, Vivianite was known as a nice mineral 
for for as for making a kind of dark blue in in paintings. <clears throat> and so vivinite is reduced iron phosphate, and because you can produce it in you can have it as a large fraction in the digested sludge. There's an option to recover it from there. And the nice thing of vivinite is that it's uh, magnetic. So with a magnetic separation, you can separate it out. And here you see this in a mining operation. Here you see it at a waste for the treatment plant, um, the same machine. And this is then the vivinite to extract out of the digested sludge. And we're currently looking to implement this at a treatment plant where we then in the end would either use the vivinite directly. Vivinite is used currently as fertilizer in the olive tree uh, farming. So we might bring it back directly to olive tree farmers, or we can separate it as, um, uh, so uh, we can separate it and bring back the iron in the treatment plant to recover more phosphate and produce uh, maybe uh, calcium phosphate or phosphoric acid as the main product in the end. And that project is uh, with PV, PV Mac uh, uh, from Vivianite and Magnetism, which is going together with mainly Chimera and Wetsis and Dutch water bottles. Cellulose, I mentioned already. So cellulose is an interesting product to recover because um, it is a significant fraction. Cellulose in, the, in winter te temperatures in, in Northern Europe is not degraded in the treatment plants. In summer times, it is partly degraded, but it ends up in the excess sludge. And it's about 20 to 30% of the excess sludge. We produce per person about 10 kilograms of cellulose or toilet paper per year, which we flush down the, the toilets. And it's very easy with a sieve to recover from the incoming water or from the sludge. So it's a very simple step to recover it. And again, the recovery costs are almost the same as the sludge disposal cost in the Netherlands. So that's why in about um, seven or eight wastewater treatment plants in the Netherlands, the cellulose is currently recovered. Now cellulose itself is of course, inter is, yeah, you can just use that for uh, any other option as, as um, uh, where you normally use cellulose, but like with phosphate, the amount of phosphate or cellulose we cover at the treatment plant is relatively small compared to all what is used in, in industry. But cellulose, which is used in toilet paper, has one advantage because it's delignified. The lignins have been removed to make the paper soft. And delignification is the first step to, to do in order to make nanocellulose. And uh, so we are looking to, to recover it mainly as nanocellulose because it will be cost effective in the nanocellulose production because the delignification step is not needed anymore, which is relatively expensive. And then with that cellulose, we can make nanocomposite materials. And in this case, we can make materials which have nice material properties, by the way, but which also resemble the, the mother of pearl of, of shells. Uh, so this is a shell and this is made from the polymers we recover from wastewater treatment plants and from the, the toilet paper we recovered at the treatment plant. So we can also make relatively nice materials out of what you flush down through the, the toilet. The biggest part we're looking at at the moment is uh, aerobic grain and sludge uh, based polymers. So uh, I Trust that some of you, but I see it's a wide audience. Uh, but I hope that all the audience know wastewater treatment in some ways. And what we did in the last decade was designing a municipal wastewater treatment plant based on bacteria forming granules instead of flocks. And by making granules, the sludge settles much better. And having a much better settling sludge means we can reduce the size of the treatment plant because we do not need the very big clarification units. So here in the background, you see the treatment plant of a treatment plant in the north of the Netherlands. And this whole area is the old treatment plant. And this is the granular sludge treatment plant, which is called Nereda. And both installations convert the same amount of wastewater. So you can see the, the, the savings in, in space from applying this granular sludge process. 
And uh, that NIRADA process is since, say, 2015 on the market. And roughly there are now about 70 NIRADA waste for the treatment plants. We have been looking to the polymers which are inside these granules. These granules, they consist about 30% of, of polymers. And these polymers, initially, their behavior is very similar to alginate. Now, if you would extract from all these treatment plants the polymers, we would have the same amount of polymer as the total world L alginate production. So we can produce a large amount of these polymers. These polymers don't look like, L they behave like alginate, they jellyfy with calcium, but they are not the same. They're completely different molecules. I will, in a minute, tell a bit about it. But we started since a year now to have a demonstration unit. That's this nice building here. Here it's under construction. This the wastewater treatment plant and the Camera extraction plant to have a demo plant where we can extract 500 tons per year of this polymer. This polymer um, can, we are looking now for all kinds of applications, but since biopolymers are relatively high value, the current market prices of biopolymers are something somewhere between three and 10 euros per kilogram. Um, uh, we think that we might find nice applications and also commercially interesting applications. And this polymer we, is brought on the market under the name Calmira, Nereda gum, and we choose Calmira because it's an interesting name, but also because it's a Maori name for chameleon and reflecting that we found many uses of this uh, Calmira. And I will just uh, introduce a few. Scientifically, this Calmira is a problem because EPS is studied by many people but it's in the end not really characterized by most of them. Uh, we, most of people who work with biofilms, they use say, a kind of sugar or protein analysis to analyze what's the EPS. But if you look in depth and detail in the molecules in the EPS, then they are very complex molecules. And actually, currently, we have no idea what these molecules are. And that made us publishing this uh, paper uh, already one half year ago. To put a point on it that we should invest time, uh, research time, in really better understanding what these polymers are, finding better analytical tools. And that's one of the main aspects of our research at the moment, to really try to characterize these polymers, find better analytical tools, and also then make them more useful. Now, why are extracellular polymeric substances, extracellular polymers, so complex to? Uh, to analyze, <clears throat> well, if you look in the literature, the main issues are that most extraction methods are not suitable to extract the polymers. You extract something, but you, in general, do not extract with them the polymers that really make the structure. Then the chemical an analysis is a problem because the sugar analysis and the protein analysis are not really suited to properly analyze the complexity of these polymers. Then if you want to understand sugar polymers, um, it's a few orders of magnitude more complex than understand the sequence of DNA. We can be very proud that we can sequence DNA. We manage somehow to sequence proteins, but polysugars, it's much more a problem. For DNA, we have only four units, one bond gives around 4,000 of different conformations possible if you have only six monomers. And so if you have six nucleotides, then you have about 4,000 different configurations. <clears throat> For proteins, if you have only six amino acids, you already have around 10 million different configurations possible. For sugars, you don't have, you have about 12 different sugars, you have 11 bonds, you have 10 to the power 13 different uh, configurations possible. So the number of possibilities for what you could have is increasing tremendous, and then sugars tend to have all kinds of modifications like aminated sugars or O-acetylated sugars or O-sulfated sugars. So on top of that, you have also this complexity. So the complexity of analyzing polysugars is several orders of magnitude higher than that of DNA. 
and <coughs> we, but we're slowly getting there. And what we see is that these polymers in not in fast growing bacteria. If you have fast growing bacteria, usually pure cultures in the lab, most of the polymers are poly polysaccharides. But if you go in municipal wastewater treatment plants or in natural systems and slow growing bacteria, nitrifiers, animal bacteria, etc., these polymers in the EPS matrix are much more resembling the polymers which are in the skin of uh, mammalians and, or our own skin. And we find their glyco glycoproteins, glycosylated proteins, um, sialic acids, proteoglycan like materials. So the, the material becomes much more resembling that of uh, eukaryotes than we previously thought when we started this, that it would be simply um, a simple um, polysaccharide instead of a very complex glycoprotein. Now, what can we do with this material? Um, the interesting observation we made together with the material scientists in, in Delft was that we can make composite materials out of it. Um, normally, if you make composite materials, you need an inert material, which is called the filler, and you need a polymer. If you have oil-based polymers, you typically have 85% of oil-based polymer and 15% of filler. If you try to put in more filler, um, the, the, the material will do phase separation and you cannot add more filler to have a stable composite material. Now with biopolymers, not only with Chimera, also with alginate, with Kytosan and other biopolymers, we have seen that we can go to much higher um, amounts. So we can go to 85% of filler and only 15% of polymer. And with that, we can make a natural composite material which resembles, for instance, shells. So on the right hand side, you see what we made and you see how the shell looks under the microscope and you see that the structure is very similar. <clears throat> and until now with oil-based polymers, people tried to do it, we didn't manage. Whereas with these biopolymers, we actually quite simply manage to, to get the structures. And one of the first applications of this kind of composite materials is in coatings. Because if you have this high amount of inorganics, <clears throat> you can make a coating on, in this case, cement, which really closes off the cement. And <clears throat> if you make uh, constructions like buildings, after pouring the cement, it needs to get to remain moist for about a month in order to get good fixation of the calcium carbonates, which means that either you have all the time to spray water on it during that month or regularly, or you can coat it with, with it. And that's the first application which is on the market. It's nicely called the Delft Green, marketed by this company NGCM, <coughs> which if you spray it on the the floor of, uh, of like parking lots in the construction here. It improves the hardening of the cement. And um, it means that you can use about 10% less cement and have the same uh, uh, protection of the steel and uh, strength of the structure. So a very interesting application due to the fact that it's shielding off. Now, the other interesting ap application of the interesting uh, capacity we saw from this is that if we, we can make from the material, we can make plastics out of it or foams, <coughs> and they can be used in construction. And then, of course, the interesting thing is that in construction, flammability is important. And it's without any, adding any end flame retarded material, normally people would add, say, polybrominated or polyfluorinated materials. Um, it's, it's frame resistant. And like on this picture, you will see that if you put a flame on it, on the backside of this foam, there's no blackening, no, nothing become red, whereas the front side turns completely red. So it shows a very nice heat shielding effect of this material and actually it's flame resistant up to about 2000 degrees Celsius. And here you see the same one small block of wood coated with a chimera and one without the coating and one starts flaming and the other uh, resists the strong burning. 
<coughs> so currently we're looking to materials based on this composite material uh, for construction industry, which would on one hand give a nice uh, stiff material, recycled material, but also would prevent the addition of polyfluorinated or polybrominated uh, compounds, which are one of the most important uh, chemical compounds we like to get out of the environment. Now here you see then using this material, which uh, is coming from the treatment plant, you can make nice, um, say, jewelry out of it, just to show that uh, yeah, if you flush things down the drain, down the toilet, it doesn't mean that you, in recycling and recovery of materials, have to think about dirty things, just throw it back on the agriculture. You can make nice things out of it. And this one is especially of interest because it is made out of this chimera. It's made out of used toilet paper. The blue color is from recovered phosphate, the vivianite, and the red color is from Animox bacteria. So this piece of jewelry is almost entirely made of what you can make, get out of a wastewater treatment plant. And this blue dot here, I forgot to say, that's made out of bioplastic, the PHA produced out of the wastewater treatment plant. <clears throat> So currently the first application of Chimera is in agriculture. And that is based on the fact that already very initially it was observed that if you add Chimera to agarslands and just let uh, seeds germinate, that there's a strong root growth stimulating effect of Chimera. <clears throat> um, now, if you bring material from a wastewater treatment back into agriculture, that's allowed. There's nothing against it because you are allowed to bring uh, sludge back to the team, to the agriculture for fertilization. So if you bring it back as fertilizer, you don't need to go through all kinds of um, leg, uh, legal uh, issues. You can directly apply it on the field. Of course, you still have to think about whether it's damaging or not, but it's not. And <clears throat> so the first commercial sales of Chimera have been done, and it, actually this was the first truck which was commercially sold the, the Chimera to a company in Canada, which is using it for pellets for making seed pellets and fertilizer pe pellets. Of course, the seed coating in order for the root stimulation and the fertilizer is just, to, if you apply fertilizer on the field, you need to make pellets. Currently in these applications, they are using um, polyacrylate uh, type of polymers to bind the fertilizers together or to, to to make the coating. The polyacrylates are not non-biodegradable, actually microplastics. And uh, the farmers and also the legislator would like to minimize the use of microplastics. So Chimera could be a very interesting replacement of uh, acrylates in, uh, the, the in the fertilizer and, and seed industry. And it looks at that for the coming five years now, there will be a commercial contract um, where the, the factory will, will buy the Chimera, uh, is prepared to pay a price, which is um, covering the cost and the slight uh, profit margin on the Chimera to, um, to, have, to show that it's possible to really make commercial product out of a wastewater treatment plant and not just a product which you have to give away together with, uh, in a subsidized way. So as a summary um, uh, for resource recovery, I think there's many options there. It's a very important aspect to work on because it's one of the major waste flows out of the city. Water reuse is there, depends very much on the geography, how much you do and, and where the use will be. Energy technology is there. Um, really making an autarctic independent wastewater facility is where probably the goal should be. Cut all the lines with the electricity supplier and look if the effluent heat can be used in a sensible way inside the treatment plant. With the sludge, uh, we can use the EPS, whether this is, we look very much to the granular sludge EPS, but it might well be that the polymers which are produced in a flockland wastewater treatment plant have also value. They are different because they don't have a gelling property. They have a flocculating property. <clears throat> so you cannot make gels out of it, but this doesn't mean that they have no further value. We simply have not looked at, to it. And there are about three or four other groups in the world will look at it. 
to recover these polymers as a flocculant in the waste for the treatment. And then with that extraction, we can also probably integrate the nitrogen and phosphate removal. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention and just point to you some more general papers which have been written by a PhD student who is going to defend his thesis in the coming uh, uh, autumn. Um, but he has made a nice overview of all the different options, more from a system engineering point of view. So I want to thank you for your attention and I will stop sharing my screen. If you uh, to give Paula or someone else the option to ask questions or to uh, lead the discussion. Thank you very much, Mark, for this uh, nice presentation. We have uh, many people in the room, so I'm sure we'll we'll get some um, some interesting questions. It is uh, it is always impressive the way you put uh, things into perspective because this kind of uh, circular economy and resource recovery um, is going on, yeah. but uh, it's not only uh, go ahead uh, and do it. There's a lot of bottlenecks and limitations that uh, wastewater sector suffers like, uh, like all the other sectors. It gives a lot of options for research and for uh, new, new things like uh, the Vivianite and the EPS attention and I'm sure there are many more options than what I just uh, handled here. Yeah. That's a nice and thing then for, uh, for academia. Yes. And uh, we're getting, a, we, we started getting questions, but I, I, there is uh, just one, one general question I would like to pose is uh, you said that resource recovery is driven very much by public perception, also in the wastewater. And yeah, that, that is something that. Uh, should make us think as well. And there is always limitations concerning the, um, the suppliers, the, sp the spread of suppliers over, over space, uh, let's say. Um, and do you think a Calmira will be different from, uh, or will suffer from the same drawbacks or limitations? Just, a, just something. Yes. Yeah, no, that's uh, so, uh, the, my mate that's a bit explicit is that it's the fact that the way it is, you can look to the Netherlands and then you can see there's many places where resources are recovered. And of course it helps to further develop the technology, but it doesn't help to really bring it back. And um, some initiatives are there, but they all remain a bit hanging because there's no, not a good commercial um, backing for it. And the end treatment plants have to minimize cost. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and their main target is to hygienize the water and to clean the water for the environment. So uh, that's always the balance which you have there in the end. Yeah. Uh, but it's good to be aware of it and to, to try to see, can you find ways to either, indeed, because there are quite a few treatment plants which recover the cellulose, which recover the phosphate, done by internal motivation. The problem is then that these materials, they pile up at the treatment plant, <laughs> because that's not the direct they give them away for free, like phosphate to some golf course or something like that. But that's, yeah, that's a bit more problematic. And I guess for Vivianite, it will not be that different because it will not be that easy to make this in a commercial activity. Um, for Camera, that's why we try to do that without, um, yeah, try to, from the start, only not give it away for free to just try it in a large scale, but neatly try to find commercial activity uh, applications, because we are convinced that for biopolymers, uh, the, the the whole world market for biopolymers is limited by the production of them. Mm -hmm. um, it's very simple. For gelatin, we do not produce meat in order to produce gelatin. We produce gelatin because it's a byproduct of the meat industry. So if we all start eating even less meat, there uh, will be even less gelatin <laughs> to to yeah. produce. So. Um, and uh, so the, mar the supply of gelatin is limited and therefore the price is relatively high because there's a demand for this type of polymers and you cannot make them out of oil. That's why it's an interesting product to recover from wastewater because there's no replacement with an oil-based polymer and 
currently the market are supply limited. Now, if you start to recover from wastewater treatment plants, you can uh, recover. Uh, if you would recover from all wastewater treatment plants, the whole world, you could roughly replace 20% of the, the world markets on plastics. So that's huge because the world market on plastics is huge. It's not yeah. totally, but it's a very significant fraction. Prices will likely drop. But so we shouldn't be too caught on it. But at the same time, we see that uh, the non flammability might be a very important thing because if indeed we can scale up the production of building and construction materials and show that we do not need these very toxic flame retardants, which in mm. the end end up in the environment. I'm quite sure that the legislation will just, uh, the legislator will just forbid use these very toxic compounds to get them out of the environment. And then yeah. the price will be there. Uh, there will mostly. be a driver, yeah. Yes. So. <laughs> I see questions coming in, so I'm going to give the, um, uh, some, some opportunity for the, for the audience. And there is a uh, Tom Arnott here. He says, thanks for a great presentation. And uh, I think this question has also to do with uh, you were, what we were saying that the water industry has over a hundred years been used to getting rid of a problem, of the, the problem rather than valorizing an opportunity. And he asks whether you think, uh, or what do you think is the most effective level to our levers to push to accelerate the uptake of a valorization, maybe the drivers. Yes. <laughs> yeah. No, it's nice to see you. Well, I don't see you, Tom, but it's nice to interact <laughs> with you here. Um, but um, yeah, I think the um, uh, the in general the the engineers at the at the water boards and the uh, the water utilities. They are very interested in this uh, way. You don't need to, most of them you don't need to convince because as most water boards, there are people who, who like to um, contribute to circle economy to protect the environment, etc. So in that sense, that at that level, there's not too much missionary work needed. It's higher up in the organization where in the end you have the financial controllers, etc., who try to minimize cost, who will have to be convinced. And that's, so that's either uh, that's uh, enthusiasm, but it's also that's what we try to do with uh, showing probably also in the Netherlands with things like struvite recovery and cellulose recovery that it can be more or less cost neutral, and then there's not that much problem to implement it. And hopefully with the Chimera in the long run, we can um, develop it in a system in a in a uh, in a market product which has. Um, uh, value enough to just drive the production. And uh, from my point of view, I, I would, in, yeah, I think it would be feasible that the running cost of a wastewater treatment plant in the end can be recovered from the production and the sales of a biopolymer. The current market prices are well above that level. So if you even sit a bit below the current market prices, that must be possible, and that would be a big advantage because then the operational cost of a wastewater treatment plant can be recovered directly from the running from the running of the plant itself. And there's no direct government taxation needed, which in many countries is, gives a problem to keep the plants running. The plant can organize itself in doing so. The investment cost—that's another story—but the running cost must be feasible. So that's why we're trying to push this Chimera now because, and that's why this, I think this first batch goes in that direction. The seed and the fertilizer industry, to be honest, if we uh, have the wastewater treatment plant of Utrecht, we can supply the whole seed industry worldwide of polymer. So this is not going to be <laughs> the real uh, uh, application in the end. It is a nice application and certainly in the current state of affairs, it's, it's a very good one. But on the long run, uh, there might be other applications in agriculture because it has a good water binding activity. It might have more plant growth. Uh, we have also seen this grass that has good uh, plant growth uh, activities. So, uh, but that has hardly been exploited and should be exploited further. And then there will, will be more. And then, 
yeah, if you can bring something back to agriculture, which is not so much a fertilizer, but it even stimulates plant growth, maybe reduce pesticide needs or improve crop productivity, uh, would be very valuable from an overall circular point of view. It is a, a very interesting that you, you say that because if I may comment as, uh, or ask for further <laughs> advice, when, uh, when um, circular economy was starting, like with the word, um, yep. many people were talking about valorization, but getting this um, section of fertilization or back into, into the soil, something that would not be so trendy or so fashionable, but really, from what I also from what I hear from you, is uh, is one of the big trends because we always have to get back the the carbon and nutrients to the soil. So it's good that this yeah. is coming back, not yeah. as something low, but really important in terms yeah. of the no, environment. Yeah. Yeah, no, and that's uh, now currently if you recover phosphate for the. Yeah. The farmer, whether he gets the phosphate from uh, Chimera out of the mine or from the waste or chemo plant, he has no advantage on it. With the Chimera, the advantage could be if indeed the root stimulation for many plants is there, if the seedlings grow a few days quicker, the use of so the problem with other plants growing is less because the plant covers the field much more quick <clears throat> and you might need less, uh, say, chemicals. To in, in, in farming, and that that would be not only good for the environment because also chemicals are expensive, but it could even again make that farmers might be interesting to buy instead of just to get it for free. But this is a bit wishful thinking at the moment. <laughs> yes, there's another question here. Um, Ambika Devi, don't know, not sure what the, the, that's the name. He asks, What's the role of photocatalyst in wastewater treatment? Is a uh, maybe a broad question but yes. if you could say something about it yeah that's a very broad uh, question <laughs> i think in general uh, uh, my impression there that there could be very specific industrial waste flows which you better treat with photocatalysis than than with regular things but that's for, in, in specific industry for municipal wastewater i don't think so there there is of course in effluent um, if you would like to reuse effluent in agriculture or for other purposes, you need disinfection and their photo, uh, you know, photo systems might be irrelevant. Um, that might be relevant for removing micro pollutants in the effluent, uh, but that's, yeah, that's currently under investigation. Uh, that you might use UV or something to um, get rid of the last molecules. Uh, whether that will go anywhere or not, I can have my opinion, but that's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not in that field fully. And of course, then there's the option to, to grow algae or purple sulfur bacteria on the effluent, which is also kind of photocatalysis option, but that is usually has the problem of the, if you use solar uh, options, the land use area is in general uh, a big problem. Right. So in my view, it's either niche or depending on how it goes with all the discussion around micropollutants, if it's needed to remove them or not. And what do you want to invest in micropollutant removal? There's some other questions here. I, there are actually a lot. There was not uh, seeing them all. There's one from Antonio Martins in Orlando. He, he also says a great presentation, Mark. Uh, and he, he, has a, he says it's a basic question. In climate suicide zones from the Southern European countries where temperatures are relatively high, I guess he means uh, Algarve, <laughs> uh, and with the space availability, do you find that an aerobic digestion in the liquid phase of the wastewater treatment plant could be a valid option? Uh, yes, in... that's a long going discussion. Mm. <laughs> that's, uh... I'm not sure whether that will easily be solved. <laughs> uh, I think Antonio might know my, my answer. Hi, Antonio. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think an anaerobic digestion is anyway for, for industrial flows uh, extremely good. In most cases, the, the wastewater is, too, is rather diluted. So you have already a problem that a significant part of the methane remains in the liquid. Methane is a very 
uh, very strong greenhouse gas. You do not like to have it escaping. I, I see the reasons why uh, UASB or maybe UASB integrated with something in Brazil, etc., might be of interest um, because it's a very easy system. It at least cleans up a bit of the water before you discharge it in, in the river, but it, it's a very mark. It, it, uh, it doesn't even take out all organic carbon. You would need post treatment. There are nice systems for that to do, but then it becomes already more complicated. Um, the anaerobic MBR might be a bit more efficient, but it's way more expensive. And due to the need for the membrane, your energy efficiencies also go down. And on the long run, it's better to convert organic material into new organic material than just burn it, what you effectively do. So overall, I don't think that UASBs and anaerobic MBRs are now might stand on some toes of people in the audience, because I know it's a heavily researched topic. In my impression, they, there might be some niches, but in general, um, compared to Nereda, I don't think, because Nereda saves also a lot of ener energy. It seems complex because you're not used to it, but it's actually much more simple to run than a normal municipal treatment plant because it's only one unit, one pump, one aerator, and no recycle flows, no bridges, no complex clarifiers with complex flows. So essentially, it's even easier to run. It needs, of course, some ex different experience. Uh, so uh, operators used to normal flock and sludge will have to adapt to a different style and different expertise, but essentially the treatment plant is much more simple. And in that sense, um, I, I don't think that U UASB or anaerobic MBRs will be very competitive, even in warmer clim climates. There is a, thank you. There is another question here concerning the private water sector. Uh, someone asks, what is the state of the art for recovery processes? So, yes, so that, that's interesting. Um, I'm not completely sure which private but water sector that is partly the industry um, which treat their wastewater. So that, that's one option. Um, yeah, there it's simply if the wastewater can be treated cheaper, they will do it. <laughs> that's, so we uh, sometimes it's a nice integration. So we, we have a project with a pulp and paper industry to uh, to produce Chimera on their wastewater and use the Chimera as a sizing agent in their paper making process instead of oil based uh, sizing agents. So then they can produce the chemicals which they need in the production process by themselves. They can also claim they are oil free. Now they still use some oil based chemicals. So that might be an advantage for some applications. But it's also then they convert their wastewater in an own resource which they can reuse. So that's attractive for them. Um, that's the private. Then you have, of course, the municipal wastewater, which is partly treated private and partly treated public. Um, Interestingly, the Nereda technology is taken up much more quick in those places where the industry is privatized. The privatized industry will take risk. <clears throat> the public industry will not take risk. They will first do testing and evaluation and write some protocols and make sure that if they make a decision for a treatment plan that it really works. And of course, in the public industry, if they take a risk, and there is indeed a benefit against it. The benefit is with the public, but the public hardly notice that they pay less for that treatment plant. And the people at the operators, they don't get a higher salary. If it goes wrong, they get all the blame. In the private industry, it's the other way around. Well, it's not the other way around. They get both. They get the benefit and the, the blame, but they sometimes can shift it off. But at, at least they get the benefit. And that's why, uh, especially in the UK and Brazil, we're very early adapters of the Nereda, simply because there you have private operators and they count that, okay, if we invest, if we buy a Nereda plant, we save a lot of money and we have a higher profit uh, margin than when we buy a flockland sludge plant. So they didn't need extensive testing, etc. They just say, well, if it works in the Netherlands, it will work in Brazil or in UK as well, just go ahead. So that's why the introduction there goes quicker than, for instance, in the rest of Europe. 
Okay. And that will be the same for Chimera. If there's, uh, if, it, if it's economically of advantage, I'm quite sure that the privatized sector will move faster than the public sector. Um, this doesn't mean, by the way, for those who like these discussions, that I'm in favor of a privatization of the wastewater industry. I think it's much better in the hands of the public. But for innovation, it goes quicker in the private side, in the private side to be honest. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the private side would not have invested in uh, Nereda development, would not have invested in Chimera development. It's the public utilities in the Netherlands which see it as a public task to invest in that and don't look then on costs where the private industry would not have done this, I'm afraid. So both forms have advantages and disadvantages. That's very interesting. And in, in that respect, following that, do you think that uh, the, food, the food industry, for example, will be a niche for Nareda? How do you see the Nareda going further? Yes. Whether it's... Um, Yes, but then in a very different way, because the food industry in this sense is a bit particular because the food industry use, uses a lot of polymers, biopolymers. Currently, we, we, we produce uh, Chimera on the affluent of a diary industry. It's a, it's a cheese factory and we produce around 500 tons of Chimera on that uh, affluent. But actually, all that organic matter once was inside the factory and not called wastewater, but process water. If we would put that installation inside the factory, it would be a food uh, fermentation unit and not a wastewater fermentation unit. If you can put it inside, it's a food fermentation unit and we can make food great, Chimera. So, from the food industry, they might at the long run be of interest to start producing this polymer on their waste, but before the waste is called waste, you just put it right after the cheese making process unit, you put the Chimera fermentation unit, and you do this all under the regular regulation of the FDA or whoever is controlling it, and you might make food grade polymers. Uh, once it's uh, once the polymer is called wastewater, the legislation to put that back into food is so complex, just forget about it. But as long as the material you're working with is food grade, you can produce it food grade. And so for the food industry, there might be an interesting future option to go to, to have a different polymer, which um, yeah, has very good gelling properties, which has very good water binding properties. Uh, the water binding properties are similar to that of um, super absorbers using in diapers, so which for making food is quite interesting, of course, creating a lot of volume with mainly water and still having a good bite. <laughs> That's a, um, uh, it, it is an interesting line. We have not worked on it, but it's, I think it's an interesting future topic line to look what what's possible there. Yes, thank you. I just asked because we, as you know, our center is very much yes. linked to the <laughs> to the to the food industry. So yeah, no, but I think that there are future opportunities to look what this polymer could mean in food production and then put it yeah. inside and not call it waste. It's also circular, but shortcut circular. Yeah, there is also here a comment from Antonio again. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's a question, but the, he says is there is a European document on fertilizer matters under discussion that does not consider sludge as a viable raw material. Um, and that could have an impact on fertilizers, uh, fertilizer biostimulant production. So I think yep. he's just uh, commenting on the political, on the need to, to debate these political issues. Yes, no, that's that's of course one of the issues, which especially also is in the um, yeah we are together with Antonio in a big EU project, water mining. So where we will have a Camera extraction unit in uh, next year or maybe after, the year after in uh, yeah. in Faro, so giving opportunities to come more often to Portugal even, and you can visit it in Faro by that by that time. But this is an important issue. Yeah. So we're currently trying to register Camera through the reach legislation. Yeah, 
Um, it's that, always that is not selling it as fertilizer, but we can really sell it as uh, polymer. The current uh, companies we found to be interested in buying the Chimera, they are in, in the United States and Canada, Canada. So we found more entrepreneurial companies there than in Europe. So yeah. that's why we now, and so we full, fulfill there the legislation of uh, Canada and the US rather than the one of Europe in the current yeah. application. Yeah. You know, we work under this uh, under this field as well with the with the biostimulants and the biofertilizer, yes. and it is a problem because the legislation yes. is stricter than uh, the, the legislation for chemicals. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, not completely because for polymers it's not that strict. Yeah, so but polymers, you can go around. For biopolymers, it's it's a bit uh, easier, except that in the legislation they think that a polymer consist of all the same repeating units, which if you have a, even if you have a protein, you have about 20 different repeating units. So that doesn't fit with the juridical people totally. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but the reach, I guess that by the end of the year, this year we will finally go through the reach qualification, which means we, we can bring it and we can get end of waste status. Mm -hmm. So then it's, it's actually not a problem to bring it on the market. Mm -hmm. I think I, I will just uh, finish with the last question if uh, nothing else comes through, which is, what is your opinion on the way forward of this narrator? Uh, even if we forget about resource recovery and we just uh, think about what treatment as it should be to reuse water or just to, to treat water, let's just, if you concentrate on that and there might be a, a, a stage where there will be retrofitting uh, going because we're getting probably to the year that uh, plants need some uh, or the treatment plants all over need some retrofitting. You think there's a space there, a wider space for Andreda technology worldwide? Yes, so in the Netherlands there are now about 10 Nereda plants because the last and Nereda was introduced very early in the Netherlands, people were aware of it. Planning times and treatment plants is five to ten years. So if you have a if you hear about a new technology, it takes at least 10 years before you will get it on, on the market, more or less. We will get it in full scale. But in the Netherlands, there are about 10 Nereda plants, and they are all retrofitted because all the treatment plants were built. And essentially, the last 10 years, there has been no other plant built than a Nereda plant. <clears throat> so it's, there's no, no other technology anymore on the market, you can say, in the Netherlands. And for other places, yeah, it's simple. If, if you are 20%, 30% cheaper and you need less space, um, it's a compelling argument. That's, uh, yeah. So it's, uh, it's there's no a... direct advantage. The effluent quality is, you can argue about, but that, that, the effluent quality is the same. So there's no direct advantage for reuse. That whether you use normal ac activated sludge systems or whether you use granular sludge systems. Mm. Uh, there's no direct advantage, yeah. but <clears throat> it's simply the equipment is uh, is more compact the and, savings. And, mm. and a bit cheaper. It's maybe not, it depends very partly also on the location. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. I hope we can, we can continue to work with you on this for many years to come. <laughs> yeah, I hope so too, because it's- And I really would like nice. to, to thank you and to thank uh, all the audience for the for being here and also for posing the questions and the comments to Mark. I think I, I covered most of them. Uh, uh, so I hope everyone goes home richer than we started. Probably we are at home, so stays at home richer <laughs> <laughs> <Yes. laughs> than when we started. So um, thank you again, Mark. Thank you. Have a nice rest of the evening. You've got to get some rest from your cycling. That's uh, more sustainable yeah, that, than... That's uh, already gone a long time. <laughs> long time almost. Yeah. That's what you're <laughs> saving is the most important. I think that you say, you say that, you said that in the beginning. And I think yeah. it's, uh, it's really important. Saving is the, is the driving word. So thank yeah. you. And uh, thanks for, uh, for everyone for being here. Uh, Maria, should I pass on to you? Muito obrigada. Thank you so much. 
peço a cada um dos participantes que tenha a amabilidade de responder a um pequenino questionário que acabei de deixar, deixar aí no bate-papo, apenas para que consigamos receber o feedback de todos os participantes. Uma vez mais, muito obrigada a cada um. Obrigada. Ok. I don't know whether we are still Maria. Yes, you are. Uh, you slowly are... the participant mm -hmm. disappearing. Are you in the big <laughs> <Yes>. room? <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> yes, we are. Okay. Yes. So Mark was a. Uh, it was very nice. Yes. It was a good. Um, a good discussion, and it, it's always good. There's some people from the water board as well. I think, yeah, yeah uh, I, of course, could not see who, who's from where. I saw Antonio there. Maybe he's still there. I see Anna, Anna Oliveira there. There was Hi, Tom. Tom is a friend of yours. Is there someone that you know, I guess? Yeah, he is in, uh, in um, UK. OK, yeah. He did say at some stage that uh, in the UK they need to work with the regulators as yes. well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> how they use in the UK. I saw some other people from, because uh, I quickly scanned, saw someone from China in the, in the... Yeah, I saw there was someone from China here. <laughs> and Antonio was here from, uh, he, did, he did tell me yesterday that he would come with, uh, with some people. Yeah. I think Antonio is not online anymore. No, I'm no, going Antonio is gone. <laughs> he's gone. But I don't think even if they were online, they cannot speak to us. This is not. Uh... No, no, but we can see the the 30 attendees. We can see which attendees are uh, fall asleep because they're still online. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there were a lot, a lot of people in. Um, yeah. Around 80 people. They can, of course, not interact uh, through the yes. camera. We can only, that's, uh, and I cannot change them. Yeah, that's the Then Maria had to either yeah. kick them out. <laughs> if you don't mind, I'm going to close the meeting. Yes, sure. Okay. Maria. Mark, we'll speak, uh, we'll speak later. Thank yes, you very okay. much. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye, Maria. Bye. 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 I'm going to teach. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Still a late, yes. Yes, a late, a late class. Bye-bye.